Hello and welcome on this final day of the Missouri a and OER Symposium. I'm Christina Verdon and I'll be the moderator for this session today, adapting and creating OER materials to improve learning for all students. Before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping items I wanna go over. Live captioning is available during this presentation. Please find the link located under the handouts tab. The session will be recorded and provided within the same portal following the symposium. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be provided under the handouts tab. Please enter all questions into the live Q&A box. We may address some questions during the session, but we'll take most at the end. We encourage you to engage with us and other attendees through the discussion forum. And we will be asking some poll questions throughout the session. You'll be able to participate in those under the polls tab. If you have any technical issues, the MEC staff are here behind the scenes to help you. Please be sure to reach out to them through the live support button. And now I'd like to in our, introduce our presenter, Dr. Yoon Zhang. In 2005, Dr. Zhang joined the MU Department of Physics and Astronomy and has been teaching College Physics I and College Physics II every year, as well as other int introductory level physics courses, and has developed numerous demonstrations to be used in lecture and outreach events. Dr. Zhang. Okay. So welcome. Um, the title of my presentation is Adapting and Creating AOER Materials to Improve Learning for All Students. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. So first, again, I'm going to briefly uh, uh, show that what I uh, so what I did in adapting and creating the AOER materials. In, and then I'm going to discuss the impact of these, uh, these measures on student accessibility. And then actually, I'm going to actually spend the, the, the majority of this uh, presentation in actually this uh, how to implement a learning-centered techniques in the courseware I created. I actually I will use two interactive examples, maybe one. We, we might only have enough time for, for one example. Okay. And then finally, I'm going to summarize again on the learning-centered techniques we can implement to help our students. So, um, so I actually, again, I teach college physics one, college physics two every year. And so in fall and the spring semester, the typical enrollment of each course is 300 and uh, 420. So the total annual, annual enrollment of these two courses together in fall and spring is about 1,200. Again, this is a big class, right? So what I did actually in, uh, in adapting the OER is actually I switched to, uh, from public, publisher's textbook to the OpenStax college physics textbook. This book actually is a humongous book. It has 13, no, 34 chapters. It has more than 1300 pages. Of course, I cannot use all of them, right? So what I did is actually I select rather than chapters in separate In creating, actually, I create my own assignments, problems on College Physics 1 and College Physics 2, and also I implement these problems on a, an online platform. I actually chose the, the platform I use called the Verify. Probably nobody has heard of this, right? Anyway, so, okay, so here, actually, I'm going to uh, compare, actually, the student affordability using the published materials or using the AOER materials. Okay. So actually, before switching to uh, OER, the publisher's textbook I used was like from Pearson. It's called the Physics by Walker and the fifth edition. Okay. So this textbook, again, the entire textbook after the current price is $245, more than that. I searched the Pearson website last week to get this the current price. So most students actually don't buy this entire book. Instead, actually, they buy uh, the book actually has uh, is broken into two volumes. Okay, volume one, volume two. Volume one is called for college physics one. Volume two is for college physics two. Okay. So the numbers in the parentheses maybe that might be the original price. Maybe last week they might have some discount. So the numbers outside parentheses they are the num the, the numbers I got from. So now in contrast, so what is the paper textbook of this OpenStax uh, college physics book costs on Amazon? The entire book actually costs $48.50. Okay. 
you can see okay, so how much money student would, would save. And uh, of, of course, many students actually maybe they actually don't use a paper book, instead they use an ebook, right? So this uh, publisher's ebook actually costs $55, and the OpenStax ebook is completely free. And again, so again, that says I have this a lot in new enrollment uh, class. I actually have to use this online homework system for assignments. So the, the Pearson's online homework, uh, homework homework system for physics is called the Master Physics. Because they have again, they call it modified the Master Physics, and to get access to that system, that to the access code costs seventy five dollars. Again, it's valid for two years, but students don't have the option to. So I, if I only need one semester, students don't have the option to buy. I mean, to get pay a lower price. So no matter what, whether you 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 have one year, one semester, you have to pay at seventy five dollars. Again, so the publisher also has a combination of ebook and uh, and um, the access code. But together, the still cost one hundred twenty dollars. Okay. So now, after switching to verify, actually verify auto access charges twenty five dollars per semester. So most students actually they take both physics, college physics one and college physics two. They pay about fifty dollars for uh, both courses. Okay, so again, this is why actually I actually this, uh, my original um, incentive to switch to OER is I feel like this is really ridiculous. A student paid more than two hundred dollars for each course. That is too much. So that's why I decided to go to the OER. And also, actually, um, in addition to the cost, actually, there are other access barriers for students. Okay, for example, using the publisher's material. Okay, of okay. course, yeah. the cost is a big hurdle because many stu students with financial hardship they cannot even afford textbook, right? And also many students, even if they, they, they were they, they can afford, but they still hesitate to be so expensive. So this actually caused the delay in the first delay account delay one, number one in their access. Now suppose students decide, okay, so now I'm going to pay for the uh, $75 a month access code. And then they actually have to set up the account. And sometimes again, when they set up the account, they encounter some tech, technical issues, and I can help resolve these issues. Right? So students actually have to contact either the publisher's representative or online support. That I can can cause maybe two days of delay. Okay. And now suppose again they have their account, and now the thing is like they actually have to connect their account to my courses. And in this process, there's a lot of confusion whether students need the course ID or not we need course ID, you know, where to find course ID. Okay. This is then again this a, a lot of confusion actually arises in this step. Okay. And then, okay, so now suppose again students have everything, and now when they actually when they go from Canvas to Mass and Physics, and there is a layer of login. So sometimes when they log in, hey, they encounter error message. And sometimes they, they have they, they either have to wait to try later to see whether the error message dis uh, disappears, or they have to contact technical support. This causes more delay. Okay, so in addition, in addition to in addition to all these layers of delays, actually there are other issues. Okay, for example, this uh, Pearson actually offers fourteen day free trial before students actually pay to get uh, to set up a uh, official account, right? But sometimes actually students when they they have the, the trial account and when they set up their paid account, sometimes they use different account names, and that actually in this state, so in, when this happens. Students, some assignment assignment under my account and some assignment uh, under another account. And I have to manually combine their scores from the two accounts. Okay. And also again from Canvas going to math and physics. So I usually choose auto grade sync, right? But even I choose auto grade sync, the syncing is not instant. So sometimes like students, they, they go to math and physics, they complete assignment, they see a good decent score. And then when they go back to Canvas, they say, oh, yeah, I have my score in Canvas is much lower. And they kind of feel, OK, they're not so sure. The email to me, I have to reply to each email, tell them, hey, the syncing will happen after the assignment is due. You actually have to wait. Okay, I actually have to reply to each email. 
And also again, because again, this uh, uh, this uh, um, muscle physically it costs like seventy five dollars. Actually, they don't give free access to all my TAs. Maybe for each semester, I can get free access to one of my more than ten TAs. Okay. So again, most of TAs don't have access, free access to the homework system. They can actually not use their, maximize their ability in helping students, right? So again, so now I'm going to show you again how under, after switching to AOER, all these uh, uh, access barriers are eliminated completely. So again, so the OpenStax e-access is included in my Canvas course site. And not only that, actually, I have a lot of flexibility dealing, dealing with the e-text. So again, so the, the e-text is into a separate chapters and sections. I can select only the relevant content. Not only that, I can actually include the relevant content in each week's module. I can even actually link the, each section to each lecture. So students actually, they want to read the, the e-text, they can hit the link immediately. They can open the e-text instead of log into Mars and Physics, find e-text, and search for the section and read. Right. And also, in, when it comes to the homework access, again, actually, the Verify actually is has been completely integrated into Mizu uh, MU Canvas, okay, actually as an external tool. When you, when you when you create an assignment, you search. Uh, external tool actually verifies there, okay? And not only that, actually the, the assignment actually is already included in my Canvas course. And here I just show you, if I uh, zoom in, again, this is what the Verify uh, as, uh, as an external tool looks like. And this is what the assignment looks like. You can enter Canvas, you hit assignment, you see, find this assignment, you can click this, uh, this um, a box and then you, then you are if you arrive at the assignment. So again, and also again, there's no um, the, the student don't need any any account in Verify. There's no login, okay, no account, no login. And also, once the student uh, complete or submitted an assignment, the grade immediately instantly actually syncs to Canvas, and actually Verify doesn't hold student grades for actually for privacy reasons. And also again, under uh, auto access, and I put uh, uh, the, uh, the verify access, the $25 under auto access. So again, like student, there's no charge for student as long as they, they drop the course before the official ad drop deadline. Actually, that is equivalent to five weeks free trial. And the tutors and TAs, they get free access. So basically all the users in my Canvas, have access to verify as long as the items are made available. That's why I say actually, so the students, all students have access to the e-textbook, to the assignments before even day one, as long as the items and the canvas are published. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, switch to this uh, learning center teaching. Again, I'm going to uh, quote this, uh, the book by uh, Phyllis Bloomberg in 2019. The name of the book is called Making Learning Center Teaching Work. So in this learning center teaching, actually, instruct, instructor actually is just a facilitator for student learning. And the instructor at first use the challenging, reasonable, and measurable learning outcomes and set clear student expectations. And after that, the instructor actually promotes and supports student achievement and success. And in the supporting and the student instructor actually, the support actually uh, comes from two main aspects, maybe boosting student motivation and the positive emotion or and they can also get promote student learning and mastery of content. Of course, these two aspects are closely integrated. So now I'm going to show you again how what I how I set up um, the learning outcome and uh, clarify student expectation. So the first learning outcome in my courses, physics one, conflicts two, the first learning outcome is to build strong understanding of the fundamental concept of physics. Again, this is now, it's kind of vague, 
right? So what I usually do is at first I point out to student again. So usually student think understanding means memorizing. So if I memorize the laws and uh, the concept, I understand, right? Of course, I point out, okay, that's not enough. Memorization is not enough because what I expect, what I expect them to do is actually student will be able to identify the physics concept laws relevant in given situations and then apply them to conceptually or qualitatively analyze the situations. And this is the level of understand, and analyze. And then the second outcome is the, to develop robust reasoning and the problem solving skills. Again, usually when students, when you ask them, what do you mean by problem solving? They usually tell you, okay, so I find the equation, I plug numbers into the equations, I use my calculator, I punch some numbers in my calculators, I get the results, right? Then I actually tell them, hey, that is not what I call as, uh, as a problem solving in my courses. It's what I, what I expect from students in terms of Overall, I said, like student, you will be able to identify and apply the physics constant laws to solve a quantitative problem at what level. So students, you're going to start from foundational problem. And then you proceed to mediating problems of increased complexity and difficulty. Okay. And then finally, you're going to solve comprehensive problems that connect multiple concepts and are solvable in multiple ways. And this is what I, the love of problem solving, I require in my course. Okay. So now I'm going to again, so after setting up that uh, learning outcomes and clarify student expectations, now I'm going to focus on promoting uh, supporting student achievement. Again, here I'm going to focus on promoting student learning and the mastery of content. Okay, so again, instructors can implement the learning center techniques in all aspects of the course, right? But in actually, but student remember they have they must carry out the learning. And in college courses, actually, the uh, significant amount of learning actually occurs in homework outside classroom, right? Now the question is what what instructors can do to facilitate student learning in homework outside class. So first, again, let's uh, discuss actually the overall challenges I or maybe the instructors face or the student face. Okay. So in general, again, students have very diverse academic backgrounds. And a significant number of students are novice learner, learners. They have no or little prior experience in my discipline of physics. And also many students, they have deficiency in problem solving and math skills. And now when it comes to um, my, uh, my course skills, since I have a lot in enrollment classes, I have to use this online homework system. Right? And then actually a widespread practice among students actually is to search internet for answers. They actually make no or very little effort to solve the problems. Then, of course, maybe many students actually, they are actually they really want to learn, right? They take homework very seriously. But then when it comes to the homework assignments, they still encounter difficulties. Okay. So what are the typical, uh, typical difficulties novice learners when they face the homework? From my own experience and from my students. Okay, again, students actually, they don't know what concept to use. Or maybe they know about the, the relevant, relevant concept equations, but they don't know them well enough to apply them. Or homework problems are similar, but not exactly the same as the worked out examples in lectures or in textbook. And then students cannot figure out how to adapt the problem learn solving method to the new problem. Or Many students, again, they are not used to this, I call this algebraic approach to solve problems. So basically this algebraic, algebraic approach means when you have a complicated problem, you have to use symbols to represent the unknown quantities. You proceed, you set up equations based on some of the concepts and principles, and then you solve 
the equations for the unknown quantities. They are not used to this math this, this way. And sometimes, again, students, maybe they can set up the equation, but then when it comes to solving the equations, the, the math skill is not efficient, not sufficient. Okay. Or the, the complicated problem involves multiple steps, and students don't know where to start or how to proceed, and also they are not sure about whether each step is correct or not. And when it comes to online homework assignments, students actually have additional frustrations. For example, sometimes students, they waste a lot of time, spend a lot of time actually on some uh, problems. It turns out that the answers were correct or wrong because of the rounding, what we call significant figures. That is actually a minor thing. Okay? But students could waste a lot of time. And also, sometimes students that they waste a lot of time because they didn't pay attention to some common errors. And as instructors, we know about these, we know the thing or discipline so well, we know what are the common errors, right? But students, when they are new, actually, even, even if we repeat something like five times, still may not all of them catch. And also the, the most difficult frustration is, again, if many problems, they, they, they need multiple steps, right? But if only final answer is submitted, and if the final answer is wrong, you can imagine how what students' reaction. So if I, I after, so I take, take a deep breath, I solve the problem, I cross my fingers and answer the answer, and enter the answer in the system, I wait, and then the, system tells me it's wrong. No what I'm gonna do. Is my way of solving the problem completely wrong? If that's the case, no matter how much I try, I'm gonna get the wrong answer again, right? Or maybe my uh, problem solving, solving method is correct. I made some mistake. So if I'm not sure about that, I can check each step right, to find a mistake, right? So again, this is actually the biggest challenge for students. Okay, so now I'm going to again um, talk about again. So um, in this uh, learning centered teaching, actually, this this word scaffolding is very frequently um, mentioned. Okay, so actually, this scaffolding actually is a temporary temporary structure of support provided by instructors. And there are three categories of uh, three types of scaffolding. They can be procedural or process. They can be conceptual for content organization, or they can even be meta cognitive for goal setting and planning for self monitoring and self evaluation. Okay, so now I'm going to actually um, discuss and how uh, I provide scaffoldings in my AOER courseware. Okay, so again, after uh, teaching this the course for more than 10 or 15 years, I decide in the best way to provide scaffoldings is to create my own assignment problems. Again, this is a very daunting endeavor. So in 2019, under a UM system AOER grant, I created 250 plus problems for college, college physics one. And then in the summer of 2020, I actually created about 200 problems for college physics two. So basically now I have this, uh, both courses, I can have this OER in my own homework assignment problems. So other benefit of, of doing so actually is, I can maybe there are other benefits. For example, the three essential components of my courses, the learning outcomes, the teaching learning methods, and assessment measures are better aligned. I actually use the same homework system verified for my online exams now. And then after the issue of academic integrity is addressed to a significant extent because I created my own problem. Students, even if they search, they cannot find exactly the same problems on the internet as my problem. Okay, so now I'm going to again use uh, maybe hopefully two examples. And I'm going to use, uh, use uh, this try first, first example. Okay, so the, the example will be interactive. And again, to 
no, I'm pretend I'm a, I'm a teacher and you are my students. Okay, again, I'm going to switch to this uh, teaching mode. Okay, and actually, in order to actually in this uh, first example or in two examples, you actually don't need to know a lot of physics. Okay, and also only simple calculation is needed. Okay, so before we, we proceed, you know, and we'll have a uh, whole number one. Okay, so and uh, so uh, how much physics? Do you think you know uh, what I'm doing here? Where do I go to the poll? You know, I'm happy. Okay, good. I, oh. I was just going to say, I'm happy to read those results to you if you need. Yeah, I think I can see it. I can see them. Yeah. So I have about, oh, still coming. Okay, so basically like, uh, so only 17% of the uh, audience think they have this amount of physics. Again, this is very typical of actually, my students. Okay. So now I'm going to, uh, where's my PowerPoint? Okay, so now actually the example, the first example I use is going to, it's called like a travel or driving. Okay, so actually this is what we are all familiar with this. Okay, so again, this is a level one question. I call it one segment. Again, this is a level one question and it's statements like this. Okay, so a car makes a 24 miles of trip at the speed of 12, 12 miles per hour. How much time in hours does the trip take? In this, you, you need a simple calculation. This is poll number two and give you four choices. Oh, wow, okay. Good. I'm glad all of you get it. Okay. So actually, this is again, even actually for this problem, actually all the students actually they get, actually we can still actually provide some uh, scaffolding. For example, I can point out this is a foundational problem. You will not stop at here, right? And also I can actually point out the learning, ob learning objective. So the learning objective of this type of problem is the relationship between three quantities, speed, time, and distance. And also I can review again, the definition of speed is distance over time. And then I can also get, I say, hey, I require students to be able to manipulate this equation in three ways, to find speed, to find time, and to find distance, and also they must be able to do this manipulation very quickly because in exams, there's a time limit, right? Students can also self-evaluate their level of mastery. Okay, so now let's move on to the next level, travel question. Okay, now the travel equity has two segments. Okay. So a car makes a 48 mile trip. It, it travels the the travel is the first half of the total distance at 12 miles per hour and the last half of the total distance at 24 miles per hour. Now the question is, how much time does the entire trip take? Okay, wow, this is a fast. So we, so we all got the correct answer is three hours. Okay, so now, okay, so so far, I think we are all pretty happy with ourselves, right? Now the next question, okay. So what is the average speed of the entire trip? I only give you two possible answers, 60 miles per hour and or 80 miles per hour. Okay, 
now. No, not over yet. Okay, so basically one third of the audience choose 16 miles per hour and two third of the audience choose 18 miles per hour. Now, what is the correct answer? Okay, now we're going to have some discussion here. Okay, so again, so here, let's see, how do we arrive at, not only again, you, you, you know how you, you, you choose the your, your answer, right? You must also be able to point out what's wrong with the other answer. Now, again, let's uh, look at how we arrive at these two answers. Okay, so uh, we use uh, total distance for the eight miles per hour, for the eight miles and divided by the total time, three hours, we get 16 miles per hour. Okay, that's one way. The second way is remember, we our first uh, part is 12 miles, mile, 12 miles per hour, and the second part is 24 miles per hour. We add them up, divide by two, we get average that's 18 miles per hour, right? So both approaches seem reasonable, but only one answer is correct. Which way do we choose? Okay. Remember the safe, safe, safest way, safest way is go by definition. Definition of average speed is total distance divided by total time. Okay. The correct answer actually is 16 miles per hour. Now, again, what's wrong with the other answer, 18 miles per hour, so, which so seems so reasonable, right? But what's wrong with the 18 miles per hour? I think if I have anybody, we can speak up. I think I want to actually ask somebody to, uh, to tell me what's wrong with the uh, 18 miles per hour. Okay. Actually, the answer is actually in general, statistically, actually when you, when you do average in general, you cannot do average as one half of volume one plus value two. Okay, so okay, so now again, this is level two, right? You can see like the problems are a little more complicated, and also there are you can have some uh, some dispute or discussion. Now let's move on to level two. Okay, so level two still involves like a two segment travel, but now again, uh, again this first one. This first part, in addition to this first part, I actually have a second part. I give you some time to read through the two statements. And now the answer is, is there any difference in the two travels? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, so two thirds of the audience choose yes and one third. Oh, now become 50 50. Okay, now becomes 50 and 50. Okay, so now before answering, and now I'm going to change, I'm going to show you a new version of the same scenario. Okay. I call case one and case two. And I also highlighted, I actually make some faces bold. And I also actually in case two, I explicitly say, hey, this case is different from case one. Okay. Now, after this, so I guess it will repeat the same poll. Is there any difference in the two travels? Okay, you all choose yes. Okay, but now actually, when it comes to student, actually, even after that, after this, some student actually they still ask whether there is a mistake in the problem because they think the two cases are the same. Okay. Or maybe a more common situation is that I see the difference in the warning, but I still don't see the difference in the two motions. Okay. 
Again, this confusion comes from this due to the understanding. So maybe I think maybe among the maybe among the, the audience, not probably some of you, you see the wording, the difference, different wording, right? But you probably you still don't know the true difference in the two scenarios, right? So now, now again, okay, what can we help? What, what, what help can we provide to students to understand, to really understand these two uh, scenarios? Okay, actually again, case one, we already, uh, we can maybe have some uh, free discussion, response to the discussion forum. So what, what else, what help can we provide to students? So I go to discussion forum. Okay. Oh, this the student uh, person disappears quickly. So you want me to show the, the question more? Okay. So let me uh, go back to my. Uh, okay. So this is uh, again the scenario. Okay. Uh, case two, case one, we already solved. Now the problem is case two. Or maybe before solving case two, what kind of, so we know like uh, so exactly how the two cases are different. Okay. So uh, I see one uh, response from Jean saying that advise students to underline the keywords and write in an equation. Okay. Are they solving for time, distance, or speed? Oh, okay. So, okay. So actually, yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Actually, um, I'm not actually at, we're not at what to solve yet. Okay. So basically, I'm still, we're still discussing exactly what's the difference between these two types. Okay. So again, what I do is actually uh, to really make students see the real difference with these two scenarios, I actually ask students in the, set, the, the case two. Okay. So the two segments have the equal time, but they have different speed. Do they have the equal distance? Now, actually, at this point, actually, students actually understand, yeah, they, they do have the same distance. In, my, in case one, the two segments have equal distance. Okay. Now, case two, actually, the two segments have different distances. And also, I can ask which segment has smaller distance, which segment has a larger distance. Students so also answer this, right? So now, actually, next step is I, I usually ask you to maybe make a drawing of the two scenarios. So case one is straightforward. Okay. So each segment is half of the total distance. Now when it comes to case two, actually the two segment, the first segment at the lower speed has shorter distance. The second segment is lot, has higher speed, has larger distance. Now you may see actually, they can visualize the difference in the two cases. Okay, so now again, it's not over yet. Okay, now for case two. So what questions do them will ask if they solve? Actually, they will solve exactly the same two questions as in case one. First, you solve for the total time, and then you will uh, calculate the average speed of the entire trip. Okay, and then also actually tell students actually these two questions, actually they, they can change the order of these two questions. So when they, when they come to their solving the problem. Okay, so now I'm going to again, uh, now also again, I also advise them that remember there's another piece of uh, information, which is the total distance of the entire trips for the eight months. Put that number on the figure. Okay. So now I'm going to, this is going to, oh, okay, now before, before solving the problem, this uh, quick poll about on the audience. So now can we solve the case two for these two questions? Let me give you some time.
Okay, so 40% of the audience is vacant soft and 60% thinks, again, they need more time. Again, I understand because it is not so trivial, actually, the part, this, this question. So now that's it's trivial, I would say trivial. So now as straightforward as the other one. Okay. So, okay, so what do we do? Okay. So actually, I'm going to pro pro uh, propose two solutions, actually. So solution one, actually, this is called the algebraic approach. So what, what we do is actually we're solving for the total time, right? I don't know the total time. I use the symbol T to represent the total time. Again, this is actually the, the, the hint, the, the stat hint I give to students. Okay? Then after this, how do you write the time for the first segment? And how do you write the time for the second segment? So total times t, first segment, half time, second segment, half time. So the first time, the time for the first segment is actually t over two. Same thing for uh, time for the second segment, t over two. Okay. Now, next step is now, can you write the distance for the first segment? Again, I, we need an equation. Now, the, there's no number here. Okay. So how do we do this? Again, from that the basic definition of speed in the right distance as speed times time. So for sex, first segment, we have speed 12 miles per hour, time is half, t to over half. We can do the same thing for the second segment distance. Okay. And now next step, we need to write set up the equation. Now, how do we set up the equation? Okay. Again, I would, if we have the audience can speak up, I would rather somebody to speak up. Well, the, the, so actually the way we set up the equation is if the two segment distance added up together, that should be equal to the total distance of 40. Okay. And now last step, we have this, we have the equation. Now apply your algebra and solve for the T, I'll skip that. The time actually is 2.67 hours. Okay. Now, after we know the total time, we can calculate the average speed of the entire trip. Okay. So actually, the average, so we go by the definition, so 48 miles divided by 2.67 hours, the average speed actually is 18 miles per hour. Okay. This number actually is familiar, right? In the case two, we already actually remember there was a possibility, a, a possible solution for which is one. Now we are seeing that number again. Okay. So now again, uh, solution two actually would be solve the second question for average speed first. How do we do that? We do we add up. 12 plus and 24 divided by 2. That gives us 18 miles per hour. Okay. Now, at this point, you have to think, hey, is this correct? Because in the uh, level 2, I told you, hey, you cannot do that. Right? In general, you cannot do that. Right? Now, I'm doing that. Is, it, is this right? Is this correct? Why? So actually, again, in general, we cannot do average as one half value one plus value two. But actually, this is actually a special case. In this case, the two segments have equal time. Actually, in this case, this way, this uh, uh, way of doing averaging actually works. So after solving for the average speed, and then we can calculate the total time, and the total time is 2.67. Two solutions back and forth. And uh, again, from this, this, this kind of discussion, every student, every, you can really make use of all these uh, discussions. We can actually learn a lot in this topic. Okay, now let me see how much time do I have. Oh, I have 15 minutes. Okay. So for the second actually example, I will just maybe do uh, something like a, a short what I what, what what I plan to do. Okay. So first I'm going to play a video. Yeah. Okay. 
So this is called Doppler effect. So actually, what so what is the point of showing this uh, this video? So actually, the topic is called Doppler effect. So basically, what I want you to pay attention to is actually when this uh, ambulance approaches you, I suppose you are the listener, right? And also when the after the ambulance passes you, and now it's moving away from you. I want you to pay attention to the pitch of the siren you hear. Okay, there's actually difference in that. Okay. I'm going to show another uh, one, and which is. Uh, this is an example of the Doppler effect. You see this car coming by? Okay. Okay, now we're going to be going past the car that's, uh, that's horn is beeping. Of course, I'm not going to go through math. Okay, so basically the, uh, so the general Doppler effect actually is like qualitative speaking. Of course, either the ambulance or the siren, the police car, and the observer is think about you as observer, right? So if the source and the observer, they get close to each, closer to each other as time goes on. And the observer will actually will hear a higher pitch. And or on the other on, on, in the country, if the source and the observer they get they get farther away from each other as time goes on, the observer actually hears a lower pitch. Okay. Or if the source and the observer they maintain a constant distance between, from each other, there's no Doppler effect. Okay. So now actually what I want to show you actually is again, uh, of course, we are now doing the math. Okay. So suppose again, I, I give you a writing problem. So while you are driving on a street, you hear a siren from an ambulance or fire engine or from a police car. What you should do is get you pull over on the roadside. Okay. If I give you this, this, uh, this uh, uh, statement, so what, how many different scenarios can you think of? Just imagine like you are, you are like you encounter situation, right? So how many different scenarios can you think of? And uh, so we can draw a picture of each, okay? So here actually, um, I come up with actually four. Okay. So for example, like uh, suppose it's a police car, you use a police car or right? your car. So the, so the police car and you actually, you can be on the same for the behind, right? or it, it could also be like you park on the road. Maybe actually you, you, you don't see the police car. Actually, this police car is always ahead of you, but it's moving away from you. Okay, or it's also possible the police car and your car you are on the opposite side of the road. You're on one side, the police car is on the other side of the road. Now the police car may be approaching you, right? Or it's also possible the police car on the other side of the street is moving away from you. Okay, so again, so if I just give you that one statement, maybe you could actually come up with four different, different scenarios. So that's why if I actually just give the statement and you can imagine what students reaction would be to this, to this question. It's not clear. I don't know exactly which scenario I'm talking about, right? And then it's supposed to solve, right? So what, what I usually do is, again, I draw a picture, okay? Again, I draw a picture. I draw a lot of pictures, actually, okay? So, okay, so anyway, so I, I, I can move on. And there the other type, actually, I can talk about the three types of Dalton effect. In each case, we can have different different scenarios, okay? 
And again, this this type at which the police car is parked in my car, or the type, uh, the type two uh, problem could be both the source, the police car, and my car are moving. This also, it can also come up with four different scenarios. Okay. So that's why I put in, in solving in the assigning Doppler effect problem, I for each scenario, I, put, I draw a picture because actually it's very, the picture visualization is very, very important actually solving the Doppler effect problem. Okay, anyway. So now actually, so uh, maybe the question is why do I choose to verify which is actually part Unknown. Okay, so at the time after I started this uh, OER project, okay, Verify was the only online platform that gave me the editor's interface so that I can implement, implement the, my problems and also I can provide numerical randomization. Okay. And being all the other, so other platforms, again, they, can, they don't give me their ed editor's uh, interface. If I want to implement my problem, I have to send my problem to them and implement. Of course, I don't want that because I keep changing the problems, right? Whenever I, keep, I, I have feedback from students, I make change. I want to do that instantly, okay? So that's why I can also with this verify platform, I can con continuously and instantly create and change the problems based on the feedback from students. Again, I already talked about the other advantage all these, uh, uh, there's, there's no extra account, extra login to verify and all the assignments, they are, in, they are integrated into Canvas. Okay. You can imagine again, I spend a lot of time creating my problem and also I draw a lot of figures and okay, I actually have a lot of fun with doing that, doing the uh, figures. Okay, so finally, I'm going to summarize again what the, the, the scaffoldings we can provide to students in terms of homework. Again, I'm going to first summarize what I have done. Okay, so I include the eight lectures or lecture and textbook examples. I explicitly point them out again for the purpose of enforcing the review on students. Again, these examples, I told them still, I tell them the examples are foundational. Okay. And then I explicitly connecting the problems to learning objectives. And then I actually, again, I include a lot of uh, diagrams, illustrations to help students visualize the situations. And also I include conceptual questions to clear, to clear misconceptions and to lead to a um, deeper understanding of the topics. And then I actually, many in some uh, complicated problems, I actually provide tutorial sections to help students to set up the problem and get started with the solution. Again, these uh, for the problem for students without a lot of experience, again, these tutorial sections are very and also, again, I break each problem into sequential steps. Again, this makes it easier for students to understand the logic of the solution and also makes, makes it possible for them to check down the mistakes. And then I arrange the problems in the sequence of gradually, gradually increasing complexity and difficulty. Again, this allows students to gradually build their problem solving skills. And also I made the concept and problem solving procedures retrieved and practiced multiple times, many times. In similarly, in similar situations or in varying situations, okay, I usually give them like more detailed steps initially and then gradually I actually condense the problem. And also, um, I designed some problems that students are required to solve these problems using multiple approaches so that they can see the connections between various concepts and principles, and they can appreciate the internal consistency, consistency of the discipline. And, and also for like uh, some uh, common things to, you know, to review students' frustration, I actually induce, I include reminders of common mistakes. I actually set up the, I can set up the 
flexibility in the rounding in the rounding of numerical values. So I can set up that's leaning so that student wouldn't be stressed out. Still, actually, I can I set up the accept acceptable range to screen out mistakes. And then also I up, usually up each problem, actually I ask, I ask students to, uh, to provide some insight for students to make sense of the result, whether so what was their result, result make, does that result make sense? How to, how to interpret that? And also I actually remind students to reflect and to um, what they learned and also to help them self-monitoring their learning progress, what they have learned. And at what the level of their uh, at what level of mastery they are at, whether they are at what how how prepared are they for the exam? Because the exam they don't have all these uh, helps. Right? Okay, so now finally again, I want to invite the audience to provide your input on like what we can do, what kind of scaffoldings we can provide to students to help them learn. This is basically the end of my presentation. And uh, let's see, let's go to the discussion forum. And also, I'm open for questions. So oh, present the Just to remind folks, you can type your questions into the live Q&A box or the discussion forum. So what else can we do? Maybe think about what, what the typical questions students ask you. Yeah, of course, again, uh, I every time I rewrite the question, I add more things because from what students, from the feedback from students, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe probably I can add something else to address some students difficulty and you know like that. Yeah, I think the entire um, presentation is uh, available. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I actually didn't actually really mean to teach you physics. It's just like again, I use example to uh, to, to 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 showcase like what we could do. You know, of course, in my discipline, this is what I do. Of course, all the uh, instructors or professors in different disciplines, we can all think about uh, what uh, students' difficulty in your course and how you know we can help them. Right. If there aren't any additional questions, I want to thank Dr. Zhang so much for her presentation. I thought this was fantastic. Um, please be sure to provide your feedback on the session in the survey that will pop up when you leave. Um, due to some technical issues yesterday, we weren't able to gather feedback for all of the sessions. So if you have a session that you attended that you want to give feedback on, um, you can go back to that session. And then when you exit it, the survey should come up again. Um, the next two sessions begin at 1 p.m. and are the role of sharing and promoting OER and cultivating ecologies of care through locally sourced anthologies. Um, in the meantime, we encourage you to check out the meeting hub and interact with the attendees. Um, to leave this session, you can click the Back to Timeline button on the top left-hand corner of this portal. Thank you. Thank you, Christina.